here. <laughs> well, this morning we continue our look at the birth of Christ um, in the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 2 that we've been working our way through. And, and uh, Matthew, as we know, in this has been presenting Jesus Christ as king. And that is what he keeps emphasizing, not only as a king, but as the king, the king of kings and, and uh, the anointed one of God. And we see that um, from the very first chapter, and it continues all the way through all 28 chapters of, of Matthew's gospel. In chapter 1, we saw Matthew introduce um, introduced Jesus as king by virtue of his birthright. He gives this genealogy and shows that he had the right to the throne of David. And then in the last half of that chapter, we saw the deity that, that was given that throne, that uh, his royal genealogy from the, from the deity side, that he had the right to reign in Israel through the virgin birth. And it was confirmed by that. And, and there were God bypassed the sin nature of man and in a miracle gave us a virgin birth. Uh, that frees Christ from being disqualified and left him with the, the right, again, to the throne. Well, in chapter 2, we've seen Matthew emphasize Jesus as king in two ways. And first, um, in the first 12 verses, the, the arrival of the Magi. We looked at those the kingmakers of the Orient world that came, um, recognizing Christ as king. The world's represented by these wise men, these magi who came from, from the east, those the, from the Persian Empire. These guys would come and, and, and bow before him and proclaim uh, king. Um, from the, the prophecies that they had heard from, uh, from Daniel that had been passed down to them, and, and they, saw the, they saw the signs in heaven and the star, the, the, the supernatural event that God created to, to bring them to that place. And so we saw that as they proclaimed his king. Second, we saw the, with the antagonism of Herod, the proclaiming of Christ as king. Why would, why would Herod be so upset if he wasn't, Christ truly wasn't a king? Why, why would Herod uh, be worried? And so it confirming in that. And the third way that Matthew emphasizes Jesus as king in this second chapter is, he, is that Jesus fulfills messianic prophecy. Uh, in the Old Testament, God laid down a lot of prophecies about what would come in the Messiah. And uh, as we mentioned earlier today, that over 330 prophecies in the Old Testament that Christ fulfills in his birth and in his life um, and his death upon the cross, his resurrection, that are fulfilled um, in him. Over 330 prophecies. And uh, so Christ is, is king because he's born a king. He's king through the virgin birth. He's a king because he has the genealogy of a king. He's king because the Persian kingmakers saw him as a king. He's a, he is a king evidenced by Herod's fear of, taking, of his taking his throne. And he's a king because he fulfills those royal prophecies, the prophecies that, uh, of the one that was to come. And so in this text, we're going to see some extreme steps that happen where Herod tries to kill um, this one that he feared that would take his throne. And we will also see unfolding four of the prophecies from the Old Testament that happened, um, that break down. And all four of these prophecies have to do with a geographic location. Uh, they're going to talk about Bethlehem, about Egypt, about Rama, and about Nazareth, all in this, um, all prophetic uh, fulfillment of Christ. And you know, most people in their, their birth are, are associated with one place usually, right? Where they call home. <laughs> and that's kind of who, who they are. But the Old Testament says that the Messiah, the Christ, the King, would be associated with all four of those places. With Bethlehem, with Egypt, with Rama, and with Nazareth. And uh, so we find that the first one was the birth in Bethlehem. And we'll back up to some things that we had looked at previously. Verses 4 to 6 of Matthew chapter 2. It says, when he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, and is talking about Herod, he asked them, where is the Christ was to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet was written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, 
Israel. And we, we saw that in, in weeks past, that decree from Caesar Augustus and Luke's gospel that brought Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem in that perfect timing uh, for the birth of Christ. In Matthew, we see the Magi arrive. We see, we see Herod get panicky, the, the chief priests and scribes. He's asking them, these guys are saying there's some king born. Who is this? What are they talking about? And they quote Micah, the prophet Micah, Micah 5, 2. And tell him, well, it says in Bethlehem that uh, he will come. Um, so, by the way, that it's more than just that Micah 5, 2 that talks about the Messiah coming from Bethlehem. There are other Old Testament prophecies also that go along with that. But Matthew quotes Micah 5, 2 and, um, in that the Messiah will come from Bethlehem, that little insignificant town that we talked about in Sunday school. They said probably about 300 people there at that time. And that old little town of Bethlehem that Gary mentioned, that, that little village, 300 people, and the Messiah was born there. The second, so we have Bethlehem. The second one is the exodus to Egypt. And we're going to go ahead and read the, this, uh, the rest of this uh, lengthy section here, um, beginning in verse 13 to, to the end of the chapter that we've seen. He says, when they had gone, um, we've, we've been through this story now. We've had the Christmas story we, of, of the birth of Christ. And the things of coming is talked about the wise men that have come and uh, that the wise men were warned in a dream to go a different way, not go back to Herod. That's what we finished up last week. And so in verse 13, it says, when they had, had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. That they as the wise men were left. The wise men left. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I will call my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under. In accordance with that time, he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because there were, they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up and he took the child and his mother and they went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judah in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So it was fulfilled what would be said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. What an incredible process we see un unfold in these verses. Really an amazing fulfillment of the prophecy. Mary and Joseph had been told by an angel that, that this is the child, the Son of God, that Mary is going to bring forth. Emmanuel, the Savior. And, and they had this, all of a sudden, this incredible night of the birth of the baby. And, and these shepherds come and, and proclaiming this incredible story of the, the angels and the heavenly host singing and proclaiming the birth of Christ. And they've come to the child and, and all of these different things that, that are going on. And remember, all through this, now they've had an angel that came to Mary to tell her that she would be become pregnant by the Holy Spirit. We had an angel that came to Joseph and said, it's okay to take her as your wife and do that. Uh, along the way, an angel had come and, and uh, uh, told Elizabeth that she was going to have a baby in her old age, that he would be the that he was going to be special, that he would become John the Baptist that would lead, that would proclaim Christ as coming, and all these different things that are happening, the, 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 these great proclamations. And, and so they have this night and this birth of the, the baby, and then on the eighth day when they're, they're taking him for what would be right for circumcision to the temple, and there's, there's a guy, there's this old guy named Simeon there. <laughs> and he prophesies and proclaims over Jesus that this indeed is, is Messiah. But at the same time as he 
proclaims the great things. Simeon looks at Mary and says, and a sword will pierce your soul. And you're like, we're having this great celebration, this great event and all this stuff and works and our heads are spinning all. And then and he looks at her and says, and a sword will pierce your soul. What an incredible thing. And it must be what in the world. But uh, um, we see quickly how that, that comes to pass because as the, the wise men then have come to the home and left, um, after that event, that uh, they're told in a dream. And Joseph, again, they have another dream and um, that the, says that the wise men had just left in verse 12 and in verse 13. It says, when they had gone, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Night, it looks like it's the night right after they've left that they've, they've come maybe and the, the message was clear and urgent. The angel says, get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Get up, <laughs> not go plan a trip. Start checking in with a travel agent. Start making, you know, start preparing to go do something. Uh, get up and and leave. He didn't say get up and, you know, in, in the morning when you get up, start talking to Mary about maybe heading to Egypt. He tells them, get up now, take that child to his mother, and what's the word? And escape. There's an urgency there in this message for them to get up and go. Why is this important for us to know? A couple of things. The evil plans of man can never keep the plans of God from unfolding. Herod's going to kill all these babies so he knows he's going to get this guy that's going to come after his throne, right? No. <laughs> God knew Herod was going to proclaim that, and he told him, he says, get up and go now. Get up and go. God is, is protecting his son. And what an amazing thing. Where does he send him? To Egypt. Remember what happened to the Hebrews in Egypt <laughs> under Pharaoh? <laughs> and it was a place of persecution in those days and all the stuff. Now God uses that same land later. Use Alexander the Great and some other things through history to, to change the landscape of Egypt, the political landscape. And he says, get up and go. And now Egypt is going to become a safe haven for you for this time um, that's there. By the way, this journey to Egypt is uh, from where they were at to about 75 miles to the border. And a lot of guys from their studies say they probably went another 100 miles on into the land to to be safe, right? If somebody's coming after you, you probably don't stay right across the border. You probably want to go further and hide. So 100, 175 miles, whatever they, they went total. Mom, Mary, Joseph, and this little baby traveling, trying to be quiet, hide along the way to escape what an amazing thing. What, a, what, a, what trust that shows that Mary and Joseph had. What faith. That when this angel came and said, get up and go, they didn't say, wait, you don't need to give us an address to put in our phones. We don't know where we're going exactly. You just didn't go to Egypt. And that's kind of you know a generic thing. It's like, go to California, right? Well, that's kind of a <laughs> big destination. No, they got up and they responded in faith. It says, during the night, in verse 14, during the night, the angel came and said, get up, go. Take the son. Remember, again, we talked about it. It always says the son and his mother, the baby and his mother. Never talks about, doesn't call Jesus, Jesus Joseph's son in the scripture. It always says, take the baby and his mother and go. And uh, this is another one of those examples we talked about last week where that same phrase is used. During the night, got up and went. Can you imagine if you got a phone call in the middle of the night and said, you need to get up and go <laughs> right now? Well, maybe in the morning or it's dark out and I don't know. And I got to pack and I got to think about it. No, get up and go. And they did. And uh, we worry and stress and we fail to trust and believe God with the little things in our lives sometimes. <laughs> Everything that they had, they're going away. Their home had been Nazareth for them. If Joseph had a carpentry business set up there in Nazareth, they were going away from it. 
They'd already gone away from it to Bethlehem to register for this, and now they're going further away. And they're trusting God with everything they have because this is what he told them to do. And so they go, they win. Verse 15 tells us they stayed in Egypt until the death of Herod. Uh, not a long time. It, it looks like that Herod died, um, according to history, just before Passover celebration in the year that Jesus was born, it looks like. So they were maybe only there a matter of months in, in Egypt, uh, whatever time that, that uh, was necessary, that they were there. And then uh, if you skip down to verse 19, and then it says after Herod died, another angel, an angel comes back to Joseph again and tells him it's time to take the baby and his mother <laughs> and go back to Israel. It's at that time that those who were trying to kill the child are dead, he tells them. And, and again, that fulfills that prophecy that's given out of Hosea 11.1, 1, out of Egypt, I will call my son. And so we have, we have Bethlehem and we have, we have Egypt in that. And uh, so how could this child come from Bethlehem? And, and how can this child come from Egypt? Well, there you go. God does miraculous things and incredible things to fulfill prophecies given hundreds of years before. And so the third prophecy is the ravaging of Ramah that we see happen in this. Verses 16 to 18 in, in the middle of this. So, so they've gone to Egypt and they've been there and they're there and the angel tells them they need to come back in verse 19. While they were gone, right? In that period that Mary and Joseph were gone with, with Jesus in Egypt, what was happening in Israel? What was happening in and around Bethlehem? Herod pronounced that decree, and that's what we see uh, happening in, in verses 16 to 18 that was happening um, while they were gone. When Herod realized he'd been tricked uh, by the Magi that, that the angel had come and, or that the Magi had been told to take a different route. They never came back, and Herod's like, what is, what's going on? I haven't seen from these guys, heard these guys. He realizes what's happened. He says, oh, it's all right. Kill all the male children in, in and around Bethlehem that are under two years of age. Remember, when, remember, he was very specific when he was asking the Magi when they had that, not the first meeting with the Magi that we saw at the beginning of chapter 2, but a couple of verses later when he had, the, he says, called them quietly, secretly to have a meeting, and he was very specific. When did you first see this star? I want to know when this happened. I want to be sure. And so somewhere by whatever information they told him or something, that's where he said, okay, two years and under, we're going to, we're going to kill these children so that I don't miss this child. And, uh, and it says that, that uh, it says that he was furious. The uh, better translation of the Greek is probably violent rage. Um, we, we talked a little bit about Herod's past, his history, and that he was, he was, he, he was uh, violent and radical in how he did that and had killed family members and he was paranoid about his throne and all the different things that had happened. And so he sends his soldiers out to kill these children. This hard, it's hard to actually sit and read that scripture and think about that. Mamas probably running with their babies and having them ripped out of their arms and murdered and the horrible things that were happening. And so now you understand in Rama, there were voices, Rachel weeping for her children and, and the, the grief and despair that must have been in that area. And Mary and Joseph, he's taken the, Jesus and they're safe in Egypt and that is happening in Bethlehem as, as that land is being uh, the attack, those children uh, being wiped out in that. Uh, and you say, why in the world would Matthew tell us it's horrible stuff? Because it also fulfills a prophecy <laughs> that would happen. Out of Jeremiah 31, and uh, we see this. And Jeremiah, interesting thing with Jeremiah, we saw Jeremiah in Sunday school about six months ago or so, I think. And, and the, the weeping prophet, it was called, because he was delivering horrible news to Israel in his day. He knew that, that judgment was coming upon Israel, that they were going to be overtaken if they didn't repent. And they said he was, that, that as he declared this message over and over and over again to the people of Israel, that they were ignoring him. And he was weeping as he was preaching that this is coming, it's going to happen. And he was fearing that his, they would be wiped out. And that's 
That's what happens in that time frame. But in the middle of that, all of the horrible doom and gloom that Jeremiah is, is sharing in the middle three chapters in, or middle part in, of that, and in like chapters 30 to 33 in Jeremiah, suddenly he gives them a message of hope. In the midst of the horrible things that are about to happen in Israel, he gives a message of hope. And that prophecy also comes down here. In the middle of the horrible things that were happening in Bethlehem, that were happening with those children and those families, they're reminded of hope that there would be this weeping and horrible thing. But you know what? Your deliverer, your Messiah, is coming in that. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing thing, and, and a deliverer did come for those people in Jeremiah's day later, it, it, politically 70 years later, that the changes happened there. Well, why Rama and Rachel, and what does that mean? Well, there's a couple things. Um, Rama is a city about five miles north of Jerusalem. Rama is also, if you go back in the Old Testament, you find out that when there was, they were captured and the families were divided and split up, and taken into captivity, that that happened at Ramah, and families were ripped apart. And it was the horrible things happening out of that time. And, and so at Ramah, that location, <laughs> that's the deal. Rachel, who's Rachel? Rachel's the mother of Israel, right? Go back to your Old Testament. Weeping for her children. Remember we talked about a couple weeks ago, Rachel's tomb is where? In Bethlehem, Right. And so you have the women of Israel weeping over their children in this as this horrible uh, events are unfolding. And we see that uh, as that slaughter takes place. And so we have, we have Bethlehem and we have Egypt and we have Rama that I come back. And then we find Nazareth in verses 21 to 23. Herod died and the angel went to Joseph and he and he told, the angel says, you can go back home. Go back to Israel. You can go back. Now, they're coming out of Egypt. And it would make sense. They're going to get to Jerusalem and Bethlehem before they get to Nazareth, okay? <laughs> and they knew that this was God's son. He's the Messiah. He's the deliverer. It would probably make logical human sense. If you and I were making a plan to say, well, we ought to set up shop somewhere around Jerusalem. After all, he's going to be king. <laughs> he's going to be on the throne of David. We might as well stay in the neighborhood, right? <laughs> nope. Why? Because Herod's son that was here had already developed a reputation. He had developed a reputation before and had slaughtered innocent people and had done in an uprising. He had slaughtered 3,000 Jews already. They'd heard about this guy, some of the stuff about Archelaus. And when they're coming back into Israel... And Joseph hears, well, they said Herod was dead. We ought to be, oh, but Archelaus is reigning in this area. Oh, <laughs> we've heard about him. We don't want to be there. And then it says that they were sent where? To Nazareth. Which also, incidentally, if you remember when they, where did Mary and Joseph live before all of this started? In Nazareth. <laughs> and God in his miraculous provision brings them all the way back to Nazareth. You say, well, that might be nice. Kind of back home deal. Not really when you think about it. Nazareth was looked down upon. That place was so despised that, that, that uh, Nazareth and Nazarene was, was, a, was a synonym for the low life. It was an insult. It was an insult. Oh, you're from Nazareth. You know, we, we say backwoods and uh, jokes about Arkansas and Missouri, or they say them about Oklahoma, and Oklahoma says them about Alabama, whatever, whoever, all right? But, I mean, that was, that was the culture. That Naz nothing good could come out of Nazareth, right? We talked about that. <laughs> and they go to Nazareth. Remember how many, I don't know how many times in the Old Testament it tells us that Jesus was going to be despised? That he was going to be, right, looked down on and stuff? Well, hey, coming from Nazareth, fit right into that. Oh, you're the, Na the Nazarene. Jesus of Nazareth. That was just, that, that, was, that was a put down when they said that. But that's where they end up in that. Uh, 
despised and re he was despised and rejected and finally killed by his people. But folks, here's the deal. Every single location vital to the character of Jesus Christ, Matthew puts in this masterpiece of, of these chapter 2 and how it all unfolds, how all the prophecies fit together. Micah said the king would come from Beth Bethlehem. And from Bethlehem he came. Hosea said the king would come through Egypt and through Egypt he came. Jeremiah said there would be weeping and Rama and Rachel would weep for her children. And it happened. The prophets of old said his name would be Nazarene, that he would be with Nazareth. And it was so. In each point, Jesus fulfills that prophecy and solidifies the right to reign as king. He's a king by genealogy, by birth, by worship, by jealousy and hatred, and by the fulfillment of the prophecy. Born to die to save his people from their sins. Folks, there, we couldn't create such a story in our efforts and wisdom. Not only did God unfold this story, the prophecies were hundreds of years. Hundreds of years before Christ was born. And every one of them falls into place. We sit in a, in a time and a place in our world and we look around in our head spin when if you, if you see what happened this week in the news or last week or the next week, you know, and, and all the different things happening and the horrible things and we go to the grocery store and we go, how in the world do we afford this? And we go to the gas pump and we go to the and electric bill and, and, and then we, you know, and all the different things. Jesus Christ is the king. Not only is he the king, he's a wonderful counselor. In the times when we're, I don't know how to make my the ends meet and the other stuff does, well, guess what? You need to pray about that and follow his wisdom. He's, he's faithful, everlasting father. All the promises that we've seen fulfilled in scripture, he's faithful. In the times of despair, trust him. Trust him. And when your life and your world is turned upside down and you're in turmoil, he is the prince of peace. The prince of peace doesn't mean he keeps you out of the, out of the battles of life. <laughs> the prince of peace means that in our heart we can find peace in the midst of those things of life. He's all of those things. What an incredible season that as we celebrate the birth of Christ, remember completely, it's, it's not just a baby in a manger. Remember who he is and what he does and what he promises yet to do. Father, what an